Um, this is my revised title, a retrospective, um, because when I submitted this, there were uh, I, I had no idea the Peace Corps was going to eliminate all of the Masters International programs across the country on September 30th. So um, now it's a retrospective and not an ongoing thing. It also changed half my talk, so you can't believe the abstract either. <laughs> um, there used to be about 100 programs at universities across the United States. Um, I should also explain, because we have an international audience, Peace Corps is a federal agency. Uh, the United States government, they send uh, volunteers uh, primarily to developing countries. Um, there are about six to 7,000 volunteers in the field at any one time. You only need to be 18 and a United States citizen to participate, but most volunteers are between the ages of 23 and 30, single, and uh, have a college degree. Not universally true, but that's generally what happens. So as I said, they will all be officially closed on September 30th, 2016. Anybody in the program as of that date gets to finish, but nobody new gets to be added. Um, the focus of the talk is the 20 years that we've had the forestry program at Michigan Tech. For the last decade, um, we've been the largest Peace Corps Masters International campus in the country. So um, there's a lot of at least data on our side to work on. The way uh, these programs worked, um, and this is univer sort of universal across campuses across the country, and even within our program, it's not true for every single student. There's variability, this is just a generalization. But the student would come to campus, they're getting a graduate degree at the same time they're in Peace Corps. So they're on campus for one year um, in whatever discipline they're in. Uh, Peace Corps doesn't have any uh, say over the academics at this point. Then there's three months of Peace Corps training. Sometimes it's less than that, but there's a pretty substantial in-country training component of Peace Corps. It includes a lot of cross-cultural, it includes a lot of language training. Then there's two years of Peace Corps service in our country. Um, and the students, even though they might be graduate students, they are primarily Peace Corps volunteers doing Peace Corps service. I know there are a few Peace Corps volunteers out there, and you know that there's plenty of dead time when you're a Peace Corps volunteer, that you could sleep the entire day sometimes if you wanted to, and so instead my students had to go do research. Um, I am excited. And then there's one semester back on campus to finish up. Um, we try and integrate the people who are back with the people who are going out to give them a feel of what is ahead. So the picture is the ambassador, which is a local restaurant and bar. The university would buy free pizza and beer once a month for any return Peace Corps volunteer who volunteered to show up, plus everybody who was in the program. So we worked a lot to kind of get people ready to be Peace Corps volunteers. Um, we did a, a wide range of research, uh, not just ethnobotany. We would not send people out with a research idea. We would just say, go to your site, figure out what's going on, figure out what you want to do. And um, because they had two years, think about a typical master's student. They don't have two straight years in the field to work. So you could waste your entire year and still get more time than a typical uh, master's student would get in the field. Um, this particular study, if you didn't know that it was in the School of Forestry, you would have thought it was a women's studies um, project. It was a social network analysis of how women shared ideas and resources. Um, it just incidentally happened to be a gardening agroforestry group that she studied. Um, we did some things that were really traditional forestry. How, how and when should these farmers in Tanzania harvest their timber in order to get the most volume and the most money for it? Woodlot size is all smallholder farmers. Um, they're almost all well under one hectare in size. So in a sense, that's not traditional forestry, but a lot of traditional forestry ideas were applied. Um, this one starts to blend more into um, ethnobotany, but it's not quite all the way there. It's derived because um, the farmers kept asking the woman who was the volunteer there, oh, can we you know, should we be growing teak? We've heard other people are growing teak. How, what should we do about this? And so she didn't think it was a good idea, but she, would go, she decided to do this as a study. There's a linear programming model, actually. Um, and so we divided it up into different household sizes. We looked at 
how much labor was available, how much land, of different qualities of land type. Um, so we really divided up the village quite finely. And it turned out that for every single group, there was at least some benefit to growing even a small amount of teak as long as they were interested in the long-term benefits of doing that. In other words, the farmers were right. And that seems to be what always happens when we do a study. The farmers are always right. Um, this one was one that was actually published in Economic Botany. The woman had enough data, I would say, to have done a PhD dissertation, but she didn't want to stick around to do it. She collected data from all over the country and looked at regional differences, how the herbs were used, how they were collected. Um, really a massive data set. And one thing that's funny about this, you know, is that we talk about wild herb use in this. She used the Bulgarian definition of herb, which was just about anything that they used, either medicinally or for food purposes. So it included things like bark in, in here when we said herb. Um, this had nothing to do with the other one, even though it was in Bulgaria and it was also a bird use. Um, there's a paper some of you may have seen in Frostburg, and she looked at uh, the same forest type and how three different ethnic groups in one little village in Bulgaria used the uh, forested area and uh, found that the different ethnic groups, even though it's the same forest, made different uses of the landscape. So that was a, a really, at least from my perspective, a fairly interesting study. Um, this was the very first one we did. Um, the guy went into the village and decided he was going to study oil palm, not at the commercial aspects of it, but just how do people use it locally. And he wanted to understand the economics of that as well. And so he did absolutely everything that everybody there did with oil palm. And so even though it was maybe not always traditionally appropriate, he would go and do things with the women. And he, would, and he wove a basket that was to be sold in the market. And his comment in his thesis was that his basket looked so bad nobody bought it. And it was the first one that he ever made. But he also built a still and turned palm wine into hard liquor, brought a couple of bottles back to the US, and failed to give one to his academic advisor. <laughs> um, so again, a wide range of spectrum. I'm not a, uh, a geneticist at all, but we had a, a student who we just loaded the committee with geneticists. We're looking at cherimoya, a subtropical fruit. And in her area, they were just starting to market it into Toria. So there was a lot of subsistence or just home use of this. But there was also um, just the start of kind of semi-commercial production. And so as you go to more commercialization, you see the genetic base often narrow. And so the question was, you know, where are we seeing this in the early stages? And the answer turned out to be no, there was more great product genetic diversity between um, plants, or between communities and within plants. We did another one published in Economic Botany, on uh, PETA plants and, um, and, and what, how they were used in, in many different ways and how they were involved in the local culture. This one won a Distinguished Thesis Award. Here's another tree climbing example. But to make it even more dangerous, they climb up with uh, fire at the same time. <laughs> Um, and it was just looking at the interaction between different ownership types because there were cooperatives involved in this in the land ownership and then the balsam uh, was extracted using this fire it's a high value product and it was also a shade tree for coffee so what's the balance between shade and coffee and how the uh, actual income is distributed more and more the time is limited three things we learned it helps to have exceptional students Everybody knows this, but from our perspective, it brought in people who would never, ever have thought of coming to Michigan Tech. So um, uh, Marge is now the forester for Manhattan, except for Central Park. Casey used to work in New York. She's now the uh, urban forester for Portland, Oregon. Daniela was deputy director for a branch of New York City Parks and Recreation. Um, and now she is the head forester for Open Lands Conservancy. And Daniela was at the University of Illinois, Chicago graduate. Okay. Um, two years builds trust, and that makes research a lot easier to do. Um, this was an engineer. This is Ryan just kind of living in his house, doing a lot of work. Um, and he put in an entire water system for his community, potable water, taps in every house. 
and a nice uh, water supply system. So by the time he was really going to do work on his research, which was on water supply systems, people were really happy to work with him because he had done something that they really wanted. Um, we got to be really familiar with paperwork. Um, so Peace Corps had its own. It was actually pretty easy to do in terms of research because they didn't want to have anything to do with it. So they just kind of signed off to see that it was safe, secure, open binding violating policies. We got good at working with our IRB and we had to train them to some extent because they weren't used to what we were trying to do. But we eventually kind of worked out what needed to be done. So there was a lot of variation from country to country. So in Tanzania we had a woman doing uh, fuel wood um, and how it affected women in the community. Um, she had to get all sorts of permits to, to do this research. And she just seemed to waltz into every office and get the permit because she spoke the local language. She, you know, people knew her as a Peace Corps volunteer, or they didn't know her personally, but she could just say that. And people just seemed to be happy to help her. Um, she even went in and got the permit because she carried wood with the women. She would go out into the forests and put on a headload not as big as that, but still a pretty hefty one, and walk around and GPS the route um, that they took. And she, got, she was the only person out there who actually was legally collecting firewood because she went to the district forestry office and got a permit. It was hilarious that somebody would actually do that. But she did, so that you know, we could back up that what we were doing was you know, following all the rules and regulations. Panama might have been the hardest place for us to work. It seemed to be the most complex in terms of finding researchers and institutions to work with. We often were working in a comarca, and so we had to have different um, uh, levels of approval within the comarca. Um, and so it just again, but as we worked more and more in each country, we learned what to do. And so when we, were, we thought it was really tough working in this particular comarca, and the first time Daniela went to work with the Embora, um, we told her, oh, it's going to be terrible. Comarca is so hard to get all the paperwork done and get everything done that you need to do to work with that. And it just breathes through. So you, you can't always make generalizations. Sometimes people come into your time. You'll notice many of these pictures have children in them, and that's you know part of the integration into the community. You're just there, you're living with them. And we had one woman in Mali, and she sent a picture of her house, which had children all over the porch. And she said, yes, the children came with the house. <laughs> So, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we've done. Um, you know, kind of, I, I can talk forever about this, but uh, time's short. So I just want to thank my 200 plus graduate students. Not all were my advisees, but I was on an awful lot of those committees. The community is in the 50 plus countries where they serve. Um, despite the uh, recent closure, there's a lot of thanks that have to go out to Peace Corps because of the support they've provided and need. You know, just one person can't run a program this big. We have many faculty, staff, and administrators in Michigan Tech who have supported the program over the years. And I was a Peace Corps volunteer, and mm -hmm. I learned how to play the guitar there, and I used to have hair. So, <laughs> take any questions that you might have.